unity. Breakdown totally. There are no voices in my head. Only ghosts of too many dead Frenchmen. I talk the talk. But I never learned the language. Walk the fine line between free speech and incitement. You can kiss my First Amendment. My rights don't stem from a piece of paper like this message. To answer the questions that no one is asking, our words are on everyone's lips. We may not speak the same language, but our words are on everyone's lips. To answer the questions that no one is asking, our words are on everyone's lips. We may not speak the same language, but our words are on everyone's lips. Total war, no closure. Keep your comrades close and your friends closer. I wish I believed in God, I'd be stronger. Death would be easier. Everything comes in waves. Everyone leaves in cups. Everybody want to be a boss. Nobody want to clean it up. We're building a condos an act of violence. What is the proper response to the lies told by numbers? When I sleep, I hear sirens. When I grow up, I'm born to be. Choke cherry with the root who has the power to destroy roads. Everything must go. It's a new millennium. Everything must grow. To answer the questions everyone's asking, our words are on everyone's lips. We may not speak the same language, but our words are on everyone's lips. To answer the questions everyone's asking, our words are on everyone's lips. We may not speak the same language, but our words are on everyone's lips. The sky is a glass ceiling. Shout out to global warming. No need to be thanked. Every struggle is linked. Looking from a path, all the sea is over from weeds and cliffs. There is no road. Only a million mile drop below. When the angry brigades have all been pacified and each death has been quantified, they'll cook the books and swallow the figures. I'll catch you in the next life. Man, they thought you were fuel. And when they smelled blood, they thought they were calling the cops. But they threw you to the wolves. To answer the questions everyone's asking, our words are on everyone's lips. We may not speak the same language, but our words are on everyone's lips. To answer the questions everyone's asking, our words are on everyone's lips. We may not speak the same language, but our words are on everyone's lips. G -g Greetings and salutations, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our second episode of The Keys of the Discovery. We good? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. No, I guess so. All right. <laughs> Anywho, obviously... Work in progress, folks. That's the beauty of being live and on the air. Yes, yes. <laughs> Welcome to the guillotine. Second episode, live stream, still to, working through some of the kinks and everything like that. I'm Dr. Bones, your uh, rabidly, rabidly insurrectionary favorite conjurer, hoodoo man, egoist, all sorts of fun stuff. And as always, I have my wonderful, wonderful host out from the primal empty wastelands of those states that are like vaguely square shaped I, i'm not really sure where it's at it's a general sort of line out there i mean i believe he exists in a real place but anywho brett from rev left radio how you doing brett hello everybody i'm doing very well um since this is our first live stream if people can just tweet at our uh, guillotine pod twitter address and let us know that they're hearing us or if they can't hear us anything that'd be awesome just to give us a little in real time checkups but yeah i'm doing really good um I'm excited to do this episode number two. This whole live stream process is pretty nerve wracking, but uh, I'm excited to jump into it. Absolutely. It's uh, we got a huge response and we definitely want to thank all you folks that uh, were there for our first episode. You know, it's been a, a process. We've got some amazing feedback from you guys and it definitely feels like we're getting the message out and definitely uh, creating content and, and hearing you guys talk to us and hearing some of your concerns and everything like that. It's been a great great process so without further ado let's start talking about how the wonderful wonderful capitalist world is fucking each and every one of you brett i think you want to open this up let's do it so this week the republicans have come together and they've agreed on the final version of their tax bill a tax reform bill that gop leaders have said for years that they've wanted 
one that simplifies the tax code, that doesn't add to the deficit, and one that is fundamentally fair. Just kidding, of course. It's the exact opposite of all of those things. This 1,100-page tax bill is a ruthless attack on the working class that seeks to transfer over two trillion, almost $2 trillion over to large corporations and the ultra-rich. It's full of loopholes and caveats and sneaky giveaways added in by lobbyists and corporatists meant to appease all segments of the donor class. It dramatically increases the deficit by $1.5 trillion as it extracts hundreds of billions of dollars a year out of the public sector and funnels it into the pockets of the ruling class elites. It reduces corporate tax rates from 35% to 21%, and oddly enough, it has a bunch of provisions relating to real estate that will, out of total coincidence, of course, end up benefiting Donald Trump and many high-level congressional Republicans personally. For example... You don't say. I don't say. For example, one provision allows real estate developers who own buildings through LLCs, as Trump does, to deduct 20% of the income that those properties generate. To qualify for this tax break, the properties have to be relatively newer ones that haven't been fully depreciated. Quote, this helps people who have held property for a while, like Donald Trump. Unquote. David Kamen, a law professor at New York University, told the International Business Times recently. This bill also annihilates the mandate for the liberal band-aid on the proverbial broken leg known as the Affordable Health Care Act, which in effect will increase the cost of health care and make it much more difficult to obtain, specifically for sick people. It's a sneaky way of Trojan horsing in an attack on health care reform under the guise of a tax bill. It also takes away a tax deduction aimed at helping married people with a nice little interesting caveat that exempts married couples who happen to own sports franchises. The Wall Street Journal cited a top GOP aide who said of this caveat that, quote, it preserves the ability to use the tax-exempt bonds for professional sports stadium bonds, a priority for Mr. Trump, unquote. Ah, well, at least all of, the, all of our married friends who own sports teams will be just fine. Thank God. Yeah, all of them. This tax bill, which again is over 1,100 pages, is being pushed through extremely quickly so as, to, so as to ensure the fewest amount of Americans possible will be able to read and learn about it. They are aiming to vote on the bill, which seems almost certain to pass sometime this week. The Senate version of the bill was passed in the middle of the night while most Americans were asleep, and this final version was announced on Friday evening, which is, a well, which is well known as the primary time to dump bad news so as to reach the least amount of people as possible. They do not want you to know what this bill is going to do to you. And in addition to being sneaky fucking rats about it, they deploy their army of PR people, ranging from shitty Fox News pundits to the president himself, who is pitching this bill as, quote, a Christmas present for the middle class, unquote. Whether Trump is too incompetent to understand the bill or just cynically providing cover for it is neither here nor there. He would support it either way. The guy who ran on draining the swamp, bringing back jobs, and standing up against the establishment is just as much of a gleeful fucking mascot for the ruling class as we all knew he would be. The logic being used to defend this bill is the logic of the thoroughly debunked mythology of trickle-down economics. By giving the rich and powerful more money, the fairy tale goes, these benevolent overlords will hire more of us peasants. Ah, yes, the benefits of this massive wealth transfer will surely trickle down upon us all. Not unlike piss pushed feebly through the swollen prostate-choked tubes and out of the sad flaccid cocks of old white men in suits. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, sorry. But we all know what this really is. It's the looting and plundering of the working class and the handing over of massive amounts of wealth to the ruling class. This is class war. And this is the sneaky polished and disorienting way that it's carried out under bourgeois so-called democracy. It's the improved cleverness of slave masters, colonizers, and corporate vampires. It's packaged neatly in the wrapping of technocratic policy language and obscurantism, but it's the same old capitalist scam, one we've had shoved down our throats a million times before. The only thing that separates this wealth transfer from earlier ones is the boldness of it. It seems like our rulers have stopped even pretending to give a fuck what we think. They know that our political system is such an entrenched dictatorship that the opinions of the masses are more meaningless today than they've ever been. This bill has only around 30% support, virtually all of it coming from the brainwashed zombies who listen to millionaires lie to them on Fox News and conservative talk radio all day. 
but they wouldn't give a shit if it only had 3% support. They would bash us over the head with it regardless because it serves the interests of the bourgeoisie, and those are the only people who really matter. But here's the most important thing that I really want you to remember and take away from this. Mark my words on this. Once the vampires have passed this tax bill, and almost $2 trillion is extracted from gov government revenue streams, and people have moved on and accepted this defeat, these fucking scumbags will come back in around a year with their very serious faces and their briefcases and all of their policy papers, and they will give you that look that your parents used to give you as a kid when they couldn't afford to buy you that new bike for Christmas, and they'll adjust their ties, and they will tell you in somber tones that we're really sorry, but facts are facts, and we just don't have the money to afford Medicare and Social Security anymore. These programs are going to have to be privatized because the deficit is just too big. And they, after all, are the party of fiscal responsibility. There is just no other way. It must be done. But don't worry. Your grandma will be given the highest quality cat food to eat in her old age. And the increasing amount of old people living on the streets and sleeping under bridges is just a result of them refusing to pull on those bootstraps hard enough. Sorry, folks, but this is just the cost of doing business. Now stand up, put your hand over your heart, and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Close curtain. God damn. Well, son of a bitch. Now, <clears throat> uh, where to start tapping into that? I mean, folks, let's, let's be real about this. We all know. We all know what happened. I think all of us know that yet again the american people have been bent over the counter and and fucked uh what makes this so unique what makes it so special and which even trump is calling this a once in a generation opportunity is we are looking at a entire restructuring of the american economy now there's one part of this whole tax bill that really stuck out to me that which I noticed was very, very downplayed in the media. And that is the 100% elimination of the inheritance tax. Gone. Okay. So no matter how many millions, billions, whatever you make, that money will never, ever be touched by the United States government. Mm -hmm. What that does, in effect, is turn the United States into the largest and most well-armed tax haven for the world's wealthy. You see, that's the game. A lot of times we look at the Republicans or we look at our enemies and the bourgeoisie and we think these people have just got to be fucking off the rocker. They, they, they must not understand how the world works. But that's not necessarily true. They're very aware how the world works. And in their mind, they want to create a United States where – the wealthy are free to do whatever they want. The world's wealthy. They want the United States to be the new London, right? They want to be able to have all these people living in fancy neighborhoods with purified air and everything like that. They want all the wealth to come here and they want all the wealthy to know that you and your kids will never, ever touch their fucking money. And where does that leave you? Well, um, if any of you are near a computer, I would highly, highly uh, suggest you Google search um, maybe some pictures of some shanty towns. Maybe you and your loved ones could start thinking of construction ideas and how exactly you want your roof to slant. Maybe a, a potted pan, uh, plant grown out of maybe like a two liter bottle um, to add a little bit of flair, a little bit of class, because that's the future that's running towards us. Now, I, I live in Florida. Um, I know some people that uh, live in the Bahamas, which is another sort of like tax haven. And these people live next to these resorts where American tourists go and spend hundreds, hundreds of dollars. The, the, the places are huge. They have fences and everything like that. And they're living in terrible conditions. And they have to stand there and treat these people like they're kings and queens because that's the only way to make money. Mm -hmm. So God help us if the United States in totality turns into some godforsaken fucking tourist den where all of us are just merely service employees for the wonderful, wonderful wealthy of the world. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, this is fucking terrible. This yeah. is fucking terrible. It'll probably pass. And I think all of us have got to understand that, you know, this this is real, folks. We're getting into some shit where uh, the majority of the world that you and I know is being strip mined from us exactly. in ways that we can barely even imagine. 
Yeah, and that's and that, you know asset stripping, looting, plundering. These are this is not hyperbole. I'm talking about them attacking Social Security, increasing the homelessness of of old folks. This is not hyperbole. We already are living in a context in which wealth inequality is as bad as it's ever been in the modern period. It's already terrible. This oh, it's even it, it's it's worse than uh, I think there was one study. It's actually worse than the Roman Empire. Yeah, we we're, 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 yeah this our lives are such shit. We are rivaling the rest of history, folks. Yeah, and it's it's poetic. Um, I, it's a little poetic irony there that uh, we're kind of mirroring the sort of decline of the Roman Empire. The American Empire is in decline. The ruling class knows it is. The liberals want to manage that decline, and the Republicans want to loot and plunder and asset strip everything they can from it in the meantime. Um, you know, I was looking at some numbers and some estimates, you know, this the conservative estimate for this tax bill is $1.5 trillion over 10 years being transferred to the ultra-rich. I looked at some numbers and it was about $1.2 trillion um, to eradicate all student debt in the country. Imagine what that would do to, to take away all, I have $60,000 in debt myself, to, to just wipe that away, how much that would free up working young people. Um, the other thing would be about $1.4 trillion to, to implement um, universal health care in this country. So the amount of money being taken away from the public sector and given to the, the private sector, the ultra-rich and the corporations, that money could have been used to do those two huge things that need to happen. And I, I, before we move on, I want to um, I, I told this on my Facebook page, but I, I want to tell the story of I was at work the other day. I walked down into the cafeteria during lunchtime, and we, they always have a TV playing, and this time the TV was on MSNBC News, and they were talking about this tax bill. And there's an old lady, there's a couple of ladies sitting at the at, at a table looking up watching this TV. One of the old ladies, I could audibly hear her saying, I don't understand, like what, what is like leaning over to the lady next to her, like what, what are they doing here, like what's this tax bill about? And the other lady just kind of like, you know, ignored her and kept eating, like I don't know, like shrugged her shoulders. And this lady just kept looking really intently. And then MSNBC, you know, this bastion of liberal news, brought on this talking head guy, this, you know, pale thumb of a human being with no differentiating unique qualities or features about him whatsoever. You know, these centrists that they, they lead on, they parade on and off the television. He sits there and he just, he, he, he proceeds to give the normal trickle down economic argument. He, he covers it in technocratic language and talks about how it's really going to help the working class and all this stuff. And this poor lady starts nodding her head affirming and i can only assume <laughs> accepting what this fucking vampire is, is is framing and twisting and shoving down her throat i failed as a radical and, and and some of my friends have called me out like you should have went up and talked to her it was an awkward situation i'm at work she's having lunch i'm just walking by but that's my fault my own awkwardness and and, and sort of not wanting to be confrontational or to step into somebody else's business that should not have stopped me from stepping in and saying hey that fucking guy is lying to you. Here's the real deal. I failed in that moment and I vowed to myself not to fail in those moments again. But this is the sort of, you know, what, what confused, disoriented working people are getting fed to them. And, and a lot of them are buying it and it's super sad and it's, it's heartbreaking. Well, don't worry because, um, again, I, and let's, let's silver lining here, folks. Um, if you're a radical, okay, you, you, Ladies and gentlemen, we, we are watching the demolition charges be slowly placed on the American economy and lifestyle. We're watching it happen, okay? You can see this tax plan start to manifest, and you know, you know these motherfuckers are going to be pretty much just destroying the average sort of uh, quality of life that your normal, everyday, average American has gotten used to. And, and, and there is a revolutionary opportunity. Because, especially being the heart of the empire, you know, Americans have gotten used to a certain amount of life. We, we, we don't expect our power to be off. We expect to be well-fed. We expect to be able to do the things we want to do, live the way we want to live generally. As long as we have all these things, your average American seems plenty complacent. But when those things start to go away, okay, when the people start having their power turned off, when the meals start to become harder and harder to find when the depression and the anxiety mm -hmm. starts to set in and people are fighting for jobs and you're living in a neighborhood that your family is afraid to visit. It's the only thing you can afford to live in. When that existence becomes wholesale and spreads out over the country, you are going to have people that are so desperate and so worried they are going to be willing to start thinking about change. And that is the time. 
That is the time that you and I and everyone listening to this right now needs to be there. We need to be that voice before anybody else. Because a lot of people, when they're put in those dangerous situations, when it's your kids about to be on the street and your stomach that's empty, you'll hear a lot of people's opinions. And you may give some ideas a second thought that you thought you never would have. Yeah. And it's it, no coincidence that Hitler took t power right after Germany was militarily and economically in the shitter. Exactly. That's what we got to watch for. And it's coming. So, folks, we have a revolutionary opportunity. Take this moment as a lesson. Start preparing yourself. Maybe start thinking up some arguments. Start thinking out ways that maybe you can start making people aware. And, of course, also get your friends and your family situated and prepared because, again, we're coming towards a uh, gigantic shitstorm. So, but moving on, on another gigantic pile of shit, let's get to the uh, oft-discussed net neutrality. Okay, um, now, last week, the FCC, in a move um, that no doubt, okay, is pleasing to the hordes and hordes of bourgeoisie that are just in line with this tax plan. The FCC is moving uh, to remove the legislative protections we've have commonly referred to as net neutrality. Now, while not yet set in stone, let's be very clear, it is not a death knell. There is still a ch chance. It looks to be that everything's going to be passed, and once it does, all of us will be looking at higher prices depending on what sites you visit, how often, and yes, folks, yes, even how much of the foulest hentai you download and stream. They're coming for your, por they're coming for your porn, folks, okay? <laughs> they're coming. Get ready. Download as much as you can. Now, I know across the week we've heard a lot of conversations about what net neutrality is and how it works and how this repeal is going to affect you, okay? And a lot of people have been talking about the money. But I want to talk to you about something else, class warfare. You see, the internet has allowed the common people, you and I, and everybody listen, to have access to the world's knowledge. We've downloaded ancient texts. We've watched college lectures. We've learned how to build and do things that we may have never had access to. And slowly, we've taken more and more power for ourselves. We've communicated across continents. Okay, We've made friends we might never know. And we have found a small glimmer of hope in an otherwise alienated world. And the wealthy can't stand that. You see, they can't stand the idea that they can't charge you extra, that the poor and the working people can make their own media, their own education, their own worldviews. And rather than let it alone, they're going to take it away from you. They want to. One of the main things about this bill that continually seems to get uh, brushed over is the idea that these cable companies want to create fast and slow lanes for Internet traffic. OK, now let's say you run a website. OK. If you want to make sure your connection moves swiftly to the end user, you need to pay those companies an extra fee. If you don't pay, your signal might not move as fast as you'd like. It's basically like the old mafia protection rackets. Look, either you pay us or maybe uh, people don't come to your store no more without a couple of their legs broken. <laughs> if, you have, if you have a website with quote unquote questionable content, maybe quote illegal or revolutionary in nature, you could be blocked completely, yep. and they, they will shut you down. And here's the crazy thing, folks. We've seen all this before, okay? I want to give you a quote, all right? Mm -hmm. The People's mm -hmm. University of the Air will have mm -hmm. a greater student body than all of our universities put together. That's a quote from 1922. That was the director of research for the Radio Corporation of America. Uh, we have another one from good old, at the time, Herbert Hoover, the Secretary of Commerce at the time in 1922. It is inconceivable that we should allow so great a possibility for service, for news, for entertainment, and for vital commercial purposes to be drowned in advertising chatter. They were talking about the radio. You see, back in the day, back when radio was still young, it was like the internet. It was a fucking free-for-all. Okay, Every town had their own uh, wireless station. Uh, you had some of them being run out of gas stations. And when someone pulled up to the gas station, the DJ would basically say, hold on, I'll be right back. I got to go fill some gas. People were communicating. Any idea could be thrown up there, discussed, argued, fought. People were on there reading poetry, stories, arguing politics, all sorts of stuff. That all changed. 
1927, in a move very, very similar to today, Congress created the Federal Radio Commission, which endowed the power to assign wavelengths to the government. It began aggressively doing so, booting hundreds of small stations off the air to produce clear channels for the corporate interests, the big firms at the time. Wide open zones where they could broadcast with no interference and sell their products. Today, radio is a shell of its former self. It is not a place of free expression. It is a tide pool of gross and disgusting worms hell-bent on selling you focus-grouped music and advertising bullshit. The DJs on the fucking radio don't even pick the songs. Everything is controlled. There is no uniqueness. There is no creativity. There is nothing. We, in effect, lost an entire medium. Gone. What was, in the 20s, believed to be one of the greatest educational and social institutions. People thought that this was going to revolutionize humanity. Because for the first time, people could talk to one another and learn from one another for free. And they're taking that away from you today, folks. They're removing that ability from you. Exactly. And and if you if you just want to get a glimpse at, at what Bones is saying there, if you turn on FM radio or you turn on shitty conservative AM radio or you go and watch cable television with three with every three minutes there's a fucking barrage of commercials. All the programming is lowest common denominator lowbrow shit, nothing unique, nothing interesting, nothing edgy, nothing compelling. That is the same people that now want to own the internet. And it's a fucking sad fact, but as long as capitalism is in place, we're going to have to continually fight this battle. Just like two years ago in 2015 when we had to fight this battle, net neutrality was actually implemented as a, as a response to these corporations trying to throttle speeds and prioritize content and, and, and hike up fees for everyone. So we, we did that. Then they're back in 2017 trying to do it. And even if somehow these legal battles come through and we, we, we end up winning this, this fight, we're going to have to fight it again in two years because we don't live in a democracy. We live in the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. And the people who have money and power and influence will leverage that money and power and influence to ensure that insanely important mediums like the Internet is firmly under their control. It, it, it serves a few purposes. One purpose – um, it serves is the 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 like bones implied the, the pulling back of the narrative. They want their narrative out there. They want their ideas and their vision of the world prioritized over two broke assholes like me and bones. They don't want they don't want our shit to be out there. They want it to make it as hard as possible. We can barely afford to get gas to come over to this basement to do this recording. And so if, if our fees go up, if our bandwidth cost goes up, if it t costs more to host on our websites, our social media to promote our podcast, we're going to be fucked. We don't have the means to stand up to these people. Um, and, and another thing they do is the, the, the pretense of democracy. They, they used to pretend it was a democracy. They used to pretend they cared. But over 80% of Americans, over 80%, imagine getting 80% of Americans to agree on literally anything. 80%, 83% of Americans supported net neutrality. Only 30% support this GOP tax bill. Both Trump and Clinton during the campaign had disapproval ratings in the 60 to 70% range. Yet net neutrality has been gutted. Trump and Clinton were our only two options, and this fucking tax bill is likely to pass. They don't even pretend that it's a democracy or a representative Republican, uh, representative republic anymore. It's totally fucked. And the last thing I'll say about this does not get enough coverage in this discussion, but more and more info is coming out that over 2 million people's identities were stolen and they were their names were used in a bot program when the FCC opened up this decision to the public. A whole bunch of seemingly regular people were defending destroying net neutrality. That makes no sense. Well, when journalistic outlets like the Washington Post looked into it, they found that a lot of these people had their identities stolen and there's some shadowy organization behind the scenes pushing out these people's names with, with pro destroying net neutrality comments uh, on the FCC website. So from A well, and to B, we, this is bullshit. Go ahead. Yeah. Can, can we, and, and just from, can we just pause for a second and can we like dwell 
on the sheer skullduggery, the sheer scum-sucking nature that some of these people, uh, one person I saw, their mother had been dead for two years, and mm -hmm. uh-oh, suddenly her name and her picture is on a uh, internet post talking about how net neutrality isn't necessary. These people are literally willing to dig up the digital graves of the working class to push their message. There is no pity. There is no mercy. They don't care. They don't care about you people. They view Brett and I and every one of you listening to this as a bunch of livestock. They think the worst thing that ever happened to you in your life is that you got a little bit of sense and you started asking questions. And they want to shove your ass back down into the darkness. They don't want you to know anything other than the little tiny bits of knowledge they feed you and only that they give you after they've broken every bit of your will and spirit. It's coming, folks. It's coming down the pipelines. But again, we are not lost here. If we, especially as radicals, if you have quote unquote questionable ideas, we need to start figuring out out ideas to stay alive. We need to start figuring out ideas to keep our messages moving, to keep our platforms rolling, whether it's finding out uh, new ways to get our message off of the quote unquote, you know, regular internet, maybe in the dark web, but also maybe returning to physical mediums. Okay. That's up to you. And again, when we open this up to calls, I would love to hear what you think we in the radical community can do to survive what could very well be a death knell. So when we open up those lines for calls, I would love to hear what you folks say. Um, but again, Brett, I think you have another story that uh, I'm very, very happy that I did not drink too much liquor because <laughs> I get really, really angry and violent when I drink a lot of liquor. And this next story is enough to like make me really, really itch for a 45. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. I was literally about to say, I, Bones has already worked up. I'm trying not to give him an aneurysm, but this next story, <laughs> <laughs> this fucking next story is going to piss off anybody with the fucking pulse. So this next story is one that, you know, makes me fucking shake with rage. Even in the process of researching and writing this piece, I had to like step away and take deep breaths periodically to maintain some semblance of composure. The story, of course, is the story of the absolutely brutal, police murder of Daniel L. Shaver in the hallways of a hotel that he was staying at and the subsequent acquittal of the piece of shit police officer who murdered him in cold blood, Philip Brailsford. So backstory on January 18th, 2016, Daniel and two friends were inside their hotel room and Daniel was showing his friends an air gun that he used in his capacity as a pest control worker. The air rifle had a scope on it. And Daniel pointed the, the air rifle out of his hotel window to show how well the scope worked, effectively using the scope as one would use binoculars to look into the distance. A witness who was staying at the hotel saw Shaver through his window and notified the front desk. The police were notified and soon thereafter showed up at the hotel to confront Daniel and his acquaintances. Daniel, who had been drinking with his friends, was totally caught off guard by the police as he walked out of his hotel room casually, only to be confronted by screaming officers with their weapons drawn led by the officer Philip Brailsford, who had his own personal AR-15 on him and drawn and pointed directly at Daniel. Officer Brailsford commenced shouting out a slew of contradictory demands to a clearly shaken and horrified Daniel Shaver. The commands included, among many others, the command to cross his legs and keep his hands stretched to the ceiling, followed immediately by a command to crawl towards the officers. This fucking pig told Daniel to keep his hands high above his head or he would be killed. He said that even if Daniel were to start falling, he better fucking land on his face rather than take his arms down. Yet immediately after that command, Philip ordered Daniel to crawl towards him, which necessitates putting one's hands down onto the carpet in order to crawl. Throughout all of these absurd demands, Daniel can be heard sobbing and begging for his life, trying as desperately as he could to obey every illogical and physically impossible demand that was being launched at him. To watch this macabre scene is to watch a petty little scumbag tyrant feeling every ounce of socially sanctioned authority coursing through his cowardly fucking veins, barking out orders that he knew Daniel couldn't possibly obey. And then the second he had the chance, firing five bullets into Daniel's horrified, begging body, 
slaughtering an innocent man. Afterwards, he cruelly and casually walked over the dead body of the unarmed man he had just murdered without so much as even a pause. Imagine for a second what it would be like if you were innocently having a good time with friends, drinking and laughing, and then were immediately thrown into a situation where several screaming cops had high-powered weapons pointed at you, yelling incoherent and contradicting commands and threatening to murder you over and over again. Here is an audio clip of the incident. And please brace yourself because watching it is hard, listening to it is hard. The whole fucking thing is extremely hard. But, but here it is because I think it's important. Okay, young man, listen to my instructions and do not make a mistake. You are to keep your legs crossed. Do you understand me? You are to put both of your hands, palms down, straight out in front of you. Push yourself up to a kneeling position. I said, keep your legs crossed. Sorry. I didn't say this in conversation. Keep your hands. Motherfucker. I can't even fucking listen to that shit. God damn. <clears throat> After the murder of Daniel, an investigation was launched by the Mesa Police Department. Among a myriad of policy violations, they also discovered that Phillips AR-15 had a dust cover upon which was engraved the ominous words, you're fucked. That alone gives you a perfect glimpse into the mentality of the police and the psychology of this little fucking coward who needs big weapons, a badge, plenty of backup, mm -hmm. and the ability to murder innocent people to feel big and tough. Philip Brailsford was fired by the department and charged with second-degree murder. However, on December 7th, 2017, as we've seen over and over and over again in this fucking disgusting society, Philip Brailsford was found innocent on all charges and was completely acquitted by a jury after a six-week trial. He walked out of the courtroom a free man, able to do what Daniel Shaver and so many other victims of police slaughter will never be able to do, live a full life surrounded by family and friends. This cop is probably sitting on his couch with a freshly poured beer or out with his friends at some mm -hmm. fucking restaurant laughing and having a great time. While Daniel's friends and family and everyone on planet Earth with, Earth with a heart weeps over yet another totally unnecessary loss of an innocent life. I know he will never tune into this show and never hear this, but hopefully my words will resonate and echo into the cosmos for all time. Philip Brailsford, you are a cowardly piece of shit. A scared little trembling bully who, like all bullies, can only feel like a man when hiding behind a badge and dominating and oppressing those who can't possibly fight back. You better pray to whatever God you believe in that the revolution never, ever comes in your lifetime. Because I promise you, if we ever get the chance in the course of that revolution to bring real revolutionary justice down upon the heads of spineless, murdering worms like you, we will do so with the same... Hey, whoa, 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 Brett, Brett, mm. FBI, buddy, opposite. I'll say this, I'll end, I'll end it with this. You're right, I'll end it with this. I, I hope when you die, Philip. I'm sure of natural causes in old age, while you're asleep in bed, because there's no fucking justice in this world, that your body is put to rest in the only place worthy of it, a rat and cockroach infested garbage dump. Only there will you ever be truly among your own. Having said that, I, I do want to take a moment before I wrap up to highlight the situation that we're in and to explain what certain disparities like this in our so-called justice system mean at this historical moment. In the United States of America, you can literally murder an unarmed, innocent man who is begging for his life and crawling on the ground on camera and get away with it scot-free. But if you even attend a protest in which a handful of windows are broken, you will face up to 70 years in a cage. Even if they have exactly zero evidence that you've broken even a single law, 
This is because as neoliberal late capitalism spirals the drain, as the state loses legitimacy in the eyes of millions of Americans, as the quality of life for working people goes down while the pockets of the ultra-rich get thicker, the U.S. government needs increasingly to use brutal violence at home to keep the population under control. This takes two forms simultaneously. The hyper-militarization of the police along with the total acquittal of officers who abuse their power on the one hand, and the merciless crackdown of radical leftist movements on the other. The state needs to ramp up and approve of the violence perpetuated by its domestic foot soldiers on the ground, and it needs to brutally crack down on and desperately de-incentivize any dissent in the general population. As crisis capitalism continues to drain the blood of everything decent in this world, it has to dramatically increase the violence and brutality which it has always used to keep the rabble at bay to keep folks like us scattered, scared, poor, and divided. It's also worth noting that the state does not do the same thing to the far right. For example, felony conspiracy charges are leveraged against left-wing protesters who were merely present in a general area where windows were broken, but fascists and Nazis never get hit with similar charges, even when one of their own mows down people in Charlottesville, murdering our comrade Heather Heyer, or when a Nazi stabs three people in the throat on a Portland train, murdering two of them and critically injuring the third? Not once are the fascists who planned and worked with these murderers charged with any form of conspiracy or accessory charges. This is because the far right, despite all of their bullshit talk about hating the government, is not a threat to the status quo. In fact, they help enforce the very hierarchies of class, race, and gender that capitalism and the U.S. state depend on for their continued existence. The cops and fascists are, for all intents and purposes, attack dogs of the same capitalist state who use extreme violence against the very people who the state views as enemies, the poor, people of color, the revolutionary left, etc. The enemy of their enemy is their friend. And with every killer cop who goes free, and with every Nazi who gets protected, the U.S. state and the economic system of which it is a manifestation continues on. And that's truly all that matters, no matter how many innocent people have to die in the process. Oh, man. Lots to unpack there. Yeah. I mean, like, let's just, let's just, that, you know, we're, we're so, especially in this generation, and especially with the access to some of the content that, uh, people our age have, you know, you've seen people die on the internet. I have, I think everybody has, um, especially with the police violence we've watched, especially in the neighborhoods and cars of people of color, you know, they've been mowed down, uh, time and time again on footage. And this footage changes nothing, changes nothing. The jury, every time votes these cops off, it happens every time. And this guy, Daniel's last words were, yes, sir, I'm sorry, sir. As he cried and attempted to crawl towards a man with a badge and a gun and an attitude that said he was the master of the universe. We confront this horror every day and especially communities of color have confronted this every day yeah. even before we had video these people had deep with it and watch it and live it much like happens today the regular mainstream american society says well comes with the territory collateral damage Gotta have these cops. Gotta keep you safe. What are you gonna do? Call a crackhead? Folks, as we stressed in the last episode, we are in enemy territory. If you don't think that these cops would do the same thing to you in a heartbeat, you're mistaken. They will come for you. They will kill you and your family without a second thought. It's what they do. And in fact, the entire United States government depends upon an entire class of people getting away with murder. They have to give these people special privileges because they need their violence. They need their brutality and they need to make it okay. One thing I think has to be said 
and I've seen this in multiple cases, and I think it's something that we as radicals need to foster, is an absolute zero tolerance policy for people calling the police. I'm not just talking about snitches. I'm talking about the guy that called the cops on a black man that happened to be standing in the toy aisle of Walmart holding a plastic gun. Okay, I'm talking about people calling in their neighbors being loud and having someone show up and, and blow one of them away right in the yard. We need, as a community and as a movement, to make it clear that not only are the police not our friends, but that we really need to start thinking about people that talk to, people that fraternize, people that help the police as literal threats to our lives. They are. I don't, I don't know about you folks. I don't trust those people. I sure as hell don't trust those people. And I think we definitely need to keep them away from us. I think we need to keep them away from our movements. And I mean, what do you do in a situation like this? Is there going to be any justice for the person that called that, uh, it called those officers in? Is, is anyone going to talk to that person? No, they're, they're going to live the rest of their lives knowing they called down the full militarized force of the United States fucking government on a guy just trying to have a good time. He hasn't come forward. I haven't seen any report by this motherfucker out there talking about how wrong he was or any of the other people that have called the police on black folks just existing. They're never sorry. Oh, uh, I wish. Oh, I had. To. No, that shit needs to end. And again, especially nowadays, especially with the J20 case, I think all of us radical anarchists, communists, anyone that's a radical, anyone that's a revolutionary needs to understand that we are being listened to, we are being watched, and these are the same motherfuckers that are going to call the cops on you and bring this to your house. So there are certain things we have to learn to say. And again, I, we just need to stop snitching. We need to create a culture where working with the police is a Total, total taboo because this is what's killing people. And also, folks, as I've said before, these are these are the soldiers of the state. These are the soldiers of the state coming to kill you. They're killing people. This is an armed force in your community hurting the people you love. We need to start preparing. Yep. Take that rage. Take You listen to a man die tonight. You've listened to it before. You listen to a person beg for their life in tears and be executed on burst mode that's coming it's coming for you it's coming for me it's coming for everyone we love unless we begin to organize in our communities and say enough is enough we need to make areas where the police do not want to go where the calls are not coming from because as communities and as radicals we can deal with these issues within ourselves and if we can't then what good was our politics anyway and, and before I let Bones go on to the next segment, I'm not going to say much. Um, obviously, anybody that, that watches or hears that clip, if you have a heart, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tear it apart. The guy was so scared. He was crying, begging for his life. This is just a bro machismo piece of shit who murdered somebody. And this illusion, I know nobody, I'm listening, nobody listening right now has any illusions that there's good cops. But that guy, Philip Brailsford, he was not by himself. Behind him were a fuck ton of other cops. And if there was a single fucking good cop among them, they would have turned their weapons on Philip because they just witnessed a murder of an innocent man. And not only did they do nothing, they continued their fucking little police escapade, went into the room afterwards, cleared it all out. And Philip wasn't so much as even reprimanded by the fellow officers. There are two types of cops good cops, no, I'm sorry, bad cops. <laughs> And silent cops. And if there are good cops and they speak out against the bad cops, they're fired or demoted. So there's two types of cops, which is to say there's one type of cop, bad cops. And we saw it in action on camera there. And to Bones's point about not calling the police, 
that means that we need to organize alternatives to policing in our own communities. It's a huge task. The police are going to fight against it. The state is going to fight against it. They're going to pass laws against it if we start trying to do it. The Black Panther Party is a nice beginning point that we can all study in history of a group of people who tried to do that because the police, the white police, were an occupying force in their communities. They started cop watches. They became heavily armed. They monitored their own communities. That's something that we should at least try to do, but it's going to be very difficult, especially as we've talked about as capitalism circles, as late capitalism circles the drain, this, this amping up and militarization of the police to keep the domestic population in, in control is going to continue. So I'm not going to say much well, more. I'm going to hand it over to Bones and say whatever well, you want. Uh, one last thing. And also, I mean, uh, just to piggyback on that, as we discussed last episode with, you know, um, sexism and everything like that, that means we got to be hyper vigilant in our own communities for abuse. Yeah. Okay. Because just too many times this unwillingness to work with authorities creates these dead zones where we don't fill that void. And then you create cycles of abuse. You allow people that can come in and abuse people or do terrible, terrible things, and people don't do anything. We have to basically self-regulate, okay? If someone's being a shithole person, we fucking take care of it. If someone has a problem, we take care of it. That's what it's got to be. And we cannot shy away from the fact that, yes, we're going to be dealing with a whole bunch of more issues, okay? A absolutely. We have to be prepared for that if we're really in a revolutionary struggle here. We're talking real revolution. What do you do when your neighbors are screaming, fighting, throwing shit in the yard? You know, there's this extremely fine line of what's, how do you relate to that? How do you deal with that? How do you de-escalate that situation? We're going to have to study that. We're going to have to confront that. And I, I, I think it's an issue that, especially in a lot of anarchist and radical communist, everything, Every kind of revolutionary literature hasn't adequately been dealt with. But basically, community relations and how to keep a functioning community and deal with issues like that. We've got to deal with that. We've got to bring that into our own communities and start to study if we want to truly exist without the police. But now, as a sort of interesting foil to what is going on in the United States, because here at the guillotine, we absolutely have a internationalist view that's right i want to talk to you about something that apparently has been going on in europe something that has not been reported by the capitalist press <laughs> ladies and gentlemen italy has been ablaze in activity apparently on the 15th of december a masked individual on a motor scooter threw a Molotov cocktail at police vehicles parked outside a police station in prati before making a quick escape this was reported by the Italian corporate media. However, at the van suffered minor damage. This attack comes less than two weeks after the explosive attack against a police station in San Giovanni, Rome, by the Santiago Maldonado cell FAI-FRI. If the name seems strange to you, this cell has named themselves after the anarchist that was kidnapped and killed in South America. That night, a steel thermos containing 1.6 kilograms of explosives was detonated outside of a police station. This group released a communique explaining their motivations, which we at the guillotine have decided to read for purely journalistic purposes. Let me say that we at the guillotine, both Dr. Bones and Brett, do not condone any kind of behavior like this, et cetera, et cetera. This is a purely journalistic endeavor. But... We think that you people should hear what is going on in the war for the world. The communique reads as follows. In times of social peace and compliance, there is no better reply than action, a stimulus, a continuity, and a jolt to wake up those who sleep. Acting on one's own initiative breaks the compliance and inaction and ignites those whose blood boils. The anarchic praxis of attack must be the basic stimulus of anarchy. Otherwise, it is a walking dead. Action is necessary to make us alive in the ways we consider opportune, removed from every program, hierarchical and vertical structure. Many revolutionary practices are a part of an anarchism in its bowels. We have decided to take our lives into our own hands by breaking the oppressive peace that surrounds us. On the night of, 
of the 6th to the 7th of December, we placed a steel thermos containing 1.6 kilograms of explosives outside the Carbonari Barracks in the San Giovanni District in Rome. Our attentions have turned to the main guardians of the deadly order of capitalism, the police. Without them, the privileges, the arrogance, and the wealth acclimated by the owners would be nothing because they have always had the function of repressing, jailing, deporting, torturing, and killing those who by choice or necessity find themselves outside their law. The fight against the state is not simple and cannot be reduced to magic formulas, but the objectives are there, and you cannot always make theories and talk of convenience. Every individual free by desire and necessity puts theory into action here and now. There is no delegation in the struggle for freedom. What would have been in these years if an incendiary minority had not picked up the torch of anarchy? If these comrades had waited for better times? The president of the European Commission, whose Christmas was ruined, knows something about this. He knows something about the vampire of Equitalia and was mutilated by one of its claws. The sorcerer of Ansalado nuclear must have felt the heat from the torch of anarchy in his legs. Side note, they're referring to an attack where a uh, <clears throat> certain individual was shot in the kneecaps by anarchists. Today we take the torch of anarchy. Tomorrow it will be somebody else. As long as you do not turn it off. Who wants to watch will continue to watch. Who wants to justify politically not acting will continue not doing so. We are not waiting for any train of hope. We do not wait for better times. Conditions move with the confrontation. The movement is such if it acts, otherwise it stands still. The liberation of the individual from authority and exploitation is carried out by those directly concerned. Yet those who attack are driven by a continuous urge. This means propaganda of the deed. Against all cops, politicians, and their stooges. Against engineers of science and industry, against all masters, but also against all servants. Against the ranks of honest citizens of the prison. We are not interested in wasting time and energy in the critique of reformists. Although we do not consider ourselves an elitist minority, as anarchists, we have our actions and our demands, our propaganda. Every individual in affinity group develops and increases their experiences in fraternal bonding without any specialization and without wanting to impose a method. Let everyone find their way through action. The structured hierarchical organization, in addition to killing the freedom of individuals, is also more vulnerable to the reaction of oppression. It continues on, but I think you get the point that the individuals there in Italy are making. It is not Brett or my place to talk about the rightness or the wrongness of these particular actions. But I think it is important to note, comrades, that our struggles and our pain here in the United States is shared globally, that there are many Many people, many souls who have witnessed carnages that we have, who have laid down teary-eyed, thinking about people whose faces they will never ever see again, pained to walk through those doors and those buildings where once they heard the echoes of their voices. They feel that pain. And all across the world, the brutality and degradation foisted upon the people by the police and the capitalist order they represent is being fought. There is a war, an unceasing and silent war by the human spirit against all that wishes to destroy it. It may take many forms. And currently in Italy, it is taking an extremely violent form, but it is everywhere and we, in the United States must ask ourselves, where do we fit in this international struggle for liberation and freedom? Now, me personally, I have my journalism hat on. You know, I'm, I'm basically the Chris Hayes of communism. And so I can't say much. I just think it's extremely interesting what you've said. Um, I, I'll leave it at that and I'll let you take what, say whatever else you have to say and we can move on to uh, live calls after that, my friend. I think uh, I think everything is said like that. I think that ultimately um, any of that is up to everyone there. We at the guillotine are here to report and make you aware of the world as it exists. I say on to live calls. Let's do it. Do it! <laughs> the phone number is 531 
800-8339-531-600-8339. I will post it right now on the guillotine's Twitter feed for anybody that didn't catch that. But again, 531 600 8339. How you feeling, Bones? Uh fine, fine. I'm, I'm super glad I uh didn't drink a shitload of rum. <laughs> <laughs> this time I'm drinking a Tito's vodka. I've, I've upped it I've upped my game a little bit. Tito's is really fucking good. I mean, we have a deal on it at our local store, so uh, I was I our- got some uh rum produced out of St. Petersburg, Florida. We have our phone set up. Should be. That can't be just a coincidence. I have somebody calling, but we're just trying to figure it out. Let's answer. Land it up. All right. You want to take over the phone? Yeah. So yeah, I'm sorry. What, what were you drinking again? Who me? Yeah. Oh, well, right now I'm drinking a uh, no the other cheap ass beer. But before I was drinking um, uh, palm and oak. It's a uh, Rum produced out of St. Petersburg, Florida. Mm. All right. Oh, yeah, quite good. Like uh, nice coconut vanilla notes, you know. Oh, Nothing so quite awesome. excites the blood. Like, uh, oh. What's going on? Did my phone die? Is it not hooked up? No, I think that was spam. Like a telemarketer. Oh, really? Yeah. Because some automated. Device. That's fucking. <clears throat> God damn. <laughs> <laughs> Even here. Capitalist sons of bitches! God <laughs> damn you to hell! They're, they're tuning uh, in. <laughs> and I don't know. I hope this works. Somebody called this, but we're, we're extremely incompetent here at the guillotine. Yeah, they're calling again. It can't be a telemarketer. So I'll put it up to the mic or something. What's a collect call? Yeah. Call us with the collect calls. <laughs> Dude, right. so maybe someone's calling from prison. We're here. Hello. Oh, I don't think they're there. It's getting stranger by the second. No, they're not. But the CIA, thing. fuck you. <laughs> That's who it is. Clogging up our goddamn phone lines. Whoever's trying to call from, from, I think, Fort Wayne, it popped up on my phone. We're really sorry. If you're trying to call us, tweet at us or something. We're trying to figure this fucking thing out. We're accepting it? You owe us like five cents. Hello. 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 Hey, it's Prosper going home. Woo! What up? I finally got through. I'm so happy. <laughs> you collect called us. <laughs> uh, I can barely hear you guys though. What's up? Oh, shit. How are we gonna fix that? Does it not come through the internet? Or do the, uh... Are you talking to your microphone? Yeah, can you hear us at all? Yeah, I can hear you now, but it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty it's pretty grim. Okay, sorry. We'll try to speak loudly. We'll just have to fumble through these calls. Do you have a question for any of us? Uh, I wanted to talk to Bones about uh about the preparedness aspect and making anarchist communities because he and I have talked about that before. I- I'm all ears. So, I believe that you and I have talked about uh, getting preparedness and uh, getting together and making anarchist communities together. And so, I think that we've we've discussed it a couple times. But I think that the main thing that um that would be interesting in forming anarchist communities, and one of the things that I've had in my experience is that if you want a community that can self govern, if you want a community that can come together then one of the best communities, in my opinion, simply from living in it, that you can have is probably a nomadic community. Now, that's a very hard sell for a lot of people, mainly because when you're living in a nomadic community, you don't really have a job. You don't really have a way that you can provide an income for your family. Uh, A lot of the jobs that you will get will be lorded over you by bougie, middle-class motherfuckers that seem to think that they're better than you simply because you're living in an RV and not in a house. But in my family's community, in the Romani community, it was one of the best ways that we managed to get along without anybody in our community fucking with us. I think uh, 
I think that's a 100% valid tactic. And uh, especially <clears throat> in my mind, <clears throat> I like to look at communities and organizations that have sort of survived the set test of time. Um, I've talked at length about how often when I look at organizing, I like to look at criminal organizations, um, the Underground Railroad material things. And the Romani community has been a community that, if you really think about it, <clears throat> I mean, what a great example, because this is a community that has been continually preyed upon and at war, at, in essence, with the state. The state has always treated them like garbage, has always hunted them down. And these people have replicated these different tactics and everything like that in their community that have kept them alive for generations. Um, <clears throat> the nomadic thing, I think, I think for a lot of people, I don't think, I think there's two types of people that are going to hear that. There's a group of people that are going to say, if this is what works, I'm for it. And I think there's another group of people that are going to take, it's going to take a certain amount of their life going to shit to even think about that. Um, I think, especially the way the economy is going, uh, millennials, you know, we're not owning our own houses and everything like that. There is, uh, you have tiny homes that have, you know, become popular and everything like that. Uh, I think that is certainly a tactic and an open option. And more so definitely, I think, especially the thing that you drew attention to, that this sort of community that that traveling built, I think that's something that absolutely needs to be replicated and needs to be rebuilt. You know, when instead of just an affinity group, if we've got groups of people around us that we can celebrate, that we can count on if we're hungry, if someone that's going to hide us from the police. And yes, at a certain point, depending on what sort of revolutionary level you're, you're at, if you're, you know, especially one of these diehard people, you may want to move around a bit. Uh, just the other day, someone was talking about getting a group of comrades together to uh, <clears throat> get training with uh, sailboats and everything like that and start living on the water because they were never going to be able to afford a house. They wanted to have a sort of freedom of movement. I think really we as radicals need to begin putting everything on the table and analyzing, okay, how can we manage to live the lives that we desire while continually fighting the world around us? And one of the biggest pitfalls of the Romani community and one of the reasons why I can't live in it anymore with my family and the reason why we need to look at it, but also we need to look at it as a pinnacle of what we can accomplish, but we also need to look at it critically. And the biggest thing about the Romani community that most people don't realize when they're outside of it is that it's extremely xenophobic and it's also highly misogynistic as a community and so the biggest thing that we need to recognize if we're building these communities ourselves is that we need to in some semblance self-police ourselves so that way we aren't forming communities like that communities that are xenophobic communities that won't accept people communities that seem to think that women are commodities to be married off and and that sort of thing and that's one of the biggest things that i find to be like one of the problems in almost like anything, especially anarcho Twitter, is just you have all these different people talking all over each other at the same time, and so it's really hard to get groups of people together that have similar values, which is why I'm so happy that I found some uh, some comrades in, in uniqueness. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Brett, you want to uh, jump onto that? You know, I'm... I'm I have my Marxist sympathies. I, I really love the idea of reforming that community. I love the idea of of building a community around that basis, whether it's being nomadic or whether it's just having a tight knit circle of people existing for one another. Um, very much speaks to our notion of community organizing in the sense of providing an alternative to policing. So I'm I'm open to those ideas. I'm very much a whatever worksist. So if it works in this territory, if it works in that community, I'm all for it. Um, that, that's what I look for when, when, I, when I listen to and analyze ideas. And I'm, yeah, I'm down for whatever. So I, I love the interesting idea. And I, I don't have a lot of communication with, you know, like a lot of the egoist or insurrectionists uh, side of things. So I, I love learning from you guys. I think it's interesting. Oh, well, yeah. And uh, uh, again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> reiterating that point that ultimately 
it is up to us to create, you know, these social circles that aren't trash. Exactly. You know, we, we have to be oh. able if because remember, a lot of people they buy into the state because it's it's easy, right? If you have a problem with your neighbor, rather than get to know your neighbor, rather than maybe go through a very uncomfortable mm-hmm. situation, you pass the buck along. Yeah. It's it's they make living on your knees so easy. Mm-hmm. It's difficult to stand up. And that's what I was gonna say. Like, regardless of what your tendency is, everything that's worth having needs to start. It needs to start at the at the grassroots level and build up from there. Regardless of what your idea is about what the revolutionary situation should look like, what the means to the ends are, it needs to be rooted firmly in the communities. It needs to be rooted in the interests of the people that exist on the ground. It cannot be top down. It cannot be bureaucratic. It cannot be oppressive. Or else we're just we're we're redoing the same forms of oppression, the same patterns of of domination that exist today. And and we we, we don't want to just do that in a new way. We want to destroy that and build something better in this world. So I, I'm totally on board with all of that. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, you so uh, much. Bone, for calling in. Greatly appreciated. And our first successful sort of live call in. Everything seemed to work fantastic. <laughs> so boom. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very so much. much. All right. Have a good day, guys. You too. You too. Solidarity. Solidarity. <laughs> I can just bark that at people. <laughs> All right, yeah, we have a tough time because when people are talking, other people are calling in. So the lines are open right now for anybody that wants to call in. If you call and you get a busy signal or we don't answer, we're not being dicks. We just are fumbling through trying to get as many people on the show as we can. And you might be calling when somebody else is talking and there's not much else we can do about it. Maybe we'll um, we'll, we'll up our game in the future and be able to like do a queue or like screening calls and have people on a wait list and, and then move them through. But right now we're just kind of flying by the seats of our pants. So. That and it could be witchcraft. I mean, Probably that is an is option. Witchcraft. You know, that's science. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's there. Check. Yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson the other day. I swear to you, he, uh, you know, posted some crazy shit about the Satanic Bible. No, I wish he did. That'd be really cool. But no, he... we have a call. We have a call. Hello. Hello. Can you hear us? Are you alive? Uh, hey, it's uh, it's Badger Boy. Oh, it's Badger Boy. Yeah, What's up? Yeah. So, uh, piggybacking off of the uh, the nomadic uh, idea, uh, you know, to, to supplement the the nomadic uh, communities, uh, you, I'm, I'm I'm thinking build like uh, you know strongholds, autonomous strongholds as stopover spots for nomadic communities. Like 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 like, like what kind of strongholds are you talking land, about? Build a build a community base, things like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh I I, I one of the things that uh, that I think we've sort of forgotten in um, our history is like, we'll kick it over to uh, Brett's Marxist sympathies here. What was it? Uh, what was it called? Like red, red, red St. Petersburg uh, was basically back, you know, before um, back in the beginning stages of the revolution when, you know, uh, Soviet was like actually like a workers council and all that. Mm-hmm. Like uh, th- these, it was an entire city that it sort of began to run itself. It was, you know, uh, mm-hmm organizing getting everything done we have the model in um currently you know northern syria with Riyava, um the cantons and everything like that you have the zapatistas who again the zapatistas have declared themselves many many times that they are not an anarchist struggle they are an indigenous struggle right. um and so i i think worldwide we're seeing pockets of resistance and i think this goes right back into what brett was saying was starting your community start building it up and i think we should have an organic look of it. Maybe we shouldn't go into it saying this community has to do this because this is what the revolution is going to be. Let's start with radical friendship, radical community. Let's start building each other up. Let's start creating areas where you and I and everyone can be free. And we can take that and sort of begin to spread out across the world. Because as Brett said, you know, that's what the Black Panthers were doing. You know, they weren't, 
the Black oh, yeah. Panthers were, were engaging in a larger revolutionary struggle, but they weren't forgetting the people on the ground. Breakfast for Children program. I mean, right. what more of a, a revolutionary goal is it there than that? Right. Yeah, and and I would add to that by bringing in. I know you know I, I'm all about left unity and pan leftism and learning from everyone. I think something that the egoist and insurrectionary mm -hmm. anarchist community can learn from Maoism mm -hmm. is the notion of a protracted people's war, which is the notion that we're not going to topple the government and take everything over right away. But what we can do is is create little pockets of resistance in the system, and like the notion of making cops scared to come in a community. At the, at the height of the Black Panthers' power, the cops were scared to, to drive into that community because the Black Panthers were armed, they were organized, they were following them. If they only had cameras, they would have been recording them. And the notion of, of creating communities and strongholds where police and the state are not welcome and we're building up our own alternative systems is something all leftists can learn from. And the notion of connecting with your friends, that's what this show is about. We have live call-ins because we love you. You know, I was meditating the other day, and I suddenly had this overwhelming feeling of love for Bones. I, I love Bones. I hope one day we can meet, and we can hang out, and we can drink together, because I have a real deep sympathy and love for people that are engaged in this struggle. And I think that's the beginning of a building block of a better world, that, that love and that connection with, with our fellow comrades. No matter what their specific tendency is, we're in the same struggle. And, and building from that is, I think, important. <coughs> Absolutely. Just and say, uh, just just say you love me too, Bones. Just uh, say you love me too. Go ahead, Badger. <laughs> yeah, um, the, you know, building things like that, setting things like that, that up again, uh, since it's been totally dismantled since the, the, the you know, the golden age of the Black Panthers. Um, it, it's like stopover posts on, on that underground railroad you mentioned earlier, you know? Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's one of the great sort of yeah. un, uh, uh, lost to time models, you know, the sort of day to day. How did these things function? And, you know, um, you know, Brett, Brett was talking about, you know, uh, this sort of pan leftist unity. I, I have watched um, and observed from afar, clearly, um, the uh, revolutionary organization Serve the People LA. This is this is a... Uh, 100% Maoist organization. There is no deviation there. Okay. There is absolutely zero. In fact, I would go so far as to say I would be regarded as an untrustworthy criminal type, maybe by them. However, I will say this. But I, I am an untrustworthy criminal type generally everywhere I go. Criminal, it's part of being a journalist. But um, so Serve the People LA is a community. It is a... Um, uh, it is... A community that has organized against gentrification. It is uh, primarily a, a, a Latino community. It's a traditionally working class neighborhood that began to sort of be eaten away by these big developers. They have organized against it. They have not just organized as in liberal march and everything like that. They were going to uh showings and stuff like that and basically telling these people you better get the fuck out of our hood or bad shit's gonna happen to you like they, they like one real estate tried to do like talk about the most hipster bougie thing ever like a bike ride through of like potential properties oh my and God. uh serve the people i was like yeah yeah you you are not gonna be safe so i'm just <laughs> letting you know if you want to go home i would not do that <laughs> so they've successfully through very very militant tactics kept these people out of their community but they're not just doing that they are doing um community functions they do free food free entire community so i mean we're, this is some you know this is what real revolutionary shit looks like folks you know they're out there their community knows them they know them by name they're learning what they're about they're living their principles and it's so easy for us to get up here and this is a huge problem in the revolutionary community talk all this good game but we're not showing people what it looks like mm -hmm. we haven't shown people what it means to live in the worlds we're talking about and i am telling you 100 percent. and this is one of the biggest successes with the black panthers was instead of just talking to people they created openings and windows for those people to live 
their own lessons. So rather than say, you need to read this book, then you need to think about this, then you need to do this, you open up a window and say, here, this is what we're doing. You come to your own conclusions. And if you create that sort of atmosphere where people can say, you know what, what, what do I owe the United States? And you know what, maybe what do I need the police for? And wow, maybe, maybe these people around me aren't just invisible beings, but they're fellow struggling human beings like myself. And maybe we can get together and really make something happen. You know, I saw that during the hurricane. We're seeing that in Puerto Rico. You know, you give human beings the chance and they're going to do amazing things. So I think there's so many options and so many different things available and creating these community strongholds, stronghold, great word for it. You know, don't just have a community, have a stronghold, something you can depend on. I think it's where we need to go. Thank you very much, Badger. We have a new call coming in. We'll have many more episodes okay. where we can talk. Thank you so much, dude. Comrade, solidarity. Soldier. Soldier. I'm just going to yell at it at people. There you go. We have a new call. Oh, we're waiting for a call. We've had one coming in, but we fucked it up. I just wanted to add one more thing. In Omaha and Lincoln here, we have a program called Feed the People, where we go into working class, poor, and immigrant communities, and we have comrades that give them food and diaper and goods um, diapers, you know, shit for their kids, formula, um, both we've expanded from Omaha into Lincoln. So we have both cities doing this right now. It's a great way to reach into those communities, show them that you care, give them things with no, with no strings attached. We're, we're not, we're not missionaries. We're not going to talk about Marxism or anarchism with you. We're just going to make sure that you and your kids are, are cared for. And that's, what's important. We have a, we have a new call though. Hello. Hello. Not. It fell off. Yeah. All right. Try to call again. Witchcraft. We apologize. <laughs> but yeah, I totally, I totally love that idea, and I'm totally on board with it. That's so, it's well, so yeah. important. An another group that I just did an article on is the PRDC uh, STL. Um, it's a group in St. Louis that is. They are uh, originally they were providing security for uh, leftist and protest groups, but now they've grown larger and they're providing firearms training to people who may have never held a gun, who may have never experienced it. So they're getting the, these marginalized communities and people who may have been afraid of gun ownership and not known all the different ins and outs of self. Because I can tell you, especially as a gun owner, uh, gun ranges suck. Yeah. Like it's full of like the most reactionary people you're constantly being watched, this, that, and the other. And so we as leftists need to open up these areas where you can go, you can learn these defensive skills and not be judged for it. And so, again, big shout out to the PRDC STL for doing fantastic work. Fuck yeah. We got a new call. Hello. Hey, this is Ted Barry's Drock. It's on the left coast. Woo! What's up? Not much. It, it, uh, when you're calling someone, it helps to turn your mic on. I swear to God, I'm a professional. <laughs> How you doing? It's doing great out here. Um, well, I just wanted to, uh, to to know you guys are talking about um, like revolutionary communities and like nomadic communities, that kind of thing. Yep. What that reminds me of is intentional communities. There's a there's a movement going like there are you know, essentially communes, but really what they are is they are setting up uh, a community with the intention of. A, a certain goal in mind, like whether it is to live ecologically or whether it is to create a, a space for a certain amount of like freedom or whatever it is. Like you can have these kind of these kind of communities, uh, not just in like a nomadic sense. I mean, there's there's a you can have some safety as as a nomadic tribe that you are very hard to pin down by the state mm -hmm. but you also have the problem where if you're constantly on the move you're, it's very difficult to actually integrate into a community and be a kind of uh, like a revolutionary nucleus right so creating creating a, a, a community with with a very specific kind of intention and, and usually it's, it's based around some kind of formal or, or informal uh, constitution or, or like contract kind of thing um, that allows you to like set up I, I know Bones isn't going to like you but set up these kind of like social rules of these are how we um, these are how we deal with with troublemakers this is this is how we 
uh, uh, distribute the the resources and labor within the community. Right. Yeah, and I think I'm all for that. Another, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. You're, you're the caller. You're our yeah, guest. go ahead. Okay. So, so there, there was another um, uh, another thing that Bones was talking about, Red uh, St. Peter. Uh, there were sections of Vienna which also had, um, you know, cooperative housing and, you know, really revolutionary socialist communities building up, controlling their own labor, controlling their own work. And, and these kind of things, and it took um, it, it took a fascist react reactionary state actually rolling in the the tanks to like actually um, sending in the military to demolish these spaces to, uh, to to actually take that down because they were so like powerful as as a um, a tool of of like propaganda, right. and that that's that's sort of like the dichotomy of whether you are a settled commune or whether you are a, a nomadic tribe right. where a settled commune can grow very big and very powerful, but it is in a single place the state can easily get its hands on. Exactly. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the needle that you got to thread with that. Yeah. And I, I totally agree. And I think that's, you know, the pros and cons. Um, you, you can really look at revolutionary Catalonia and the Spanish civil war as an example of a community that went autonomous, mm -hmm. that took over a territory and that held it down. You know, those, those big banners of no Pasaran, you know, they shall not pass were hung over the like structures in the middle of the street. So that when the invading Franco army came, they, they saw right away, like you had this big sign that say they shall not pass. And then you have these bunkers and these barricades where all of these people are together and they're fighting against the, the fascists. Um, so there, there are pro and con, pros and cons. I very much, you know, my sympathies lie in the direction of communities building up and building out. So if you can lock down a territory and say, this is our shit, you'll attract revolutionary leftists to come to it. Um, you'll have a certain rule and guidelines of how people are expected to behave. Um, you, you start providing your own services. That's dual power. That's that's taking inside the belly of the beast, taking territory and and building up a revolutionary movement inside the belly of the beast. Um, so I really I really love that. I really enjoy that. The Zapatistas are another example of how taking over territory and expanding from that stronghold can be a really effective way of growing a movement and attracting people to that movement. Because as Bones was alluding to earlier, we're not going to get regular working class people on our side by going to them and talking highfalutin theory. They need to see with their own two eyes that what we're building in practice is better for them and their interests in reality, in real time, than it is to participate in the overarching structure. So we can only get so far with theory. We have to put it into practice. And, and building up revolutionary communities is something I think all leftists can agree on that is a, is a necessary thing to do. Absolutely. And, you know, right. and, and I, right. Yeah. I think, I, I, I think there's room, uh, because one of the things that inter is interesting is after Catalonia fell, right. Uh, a lot of people got out of the country through these informal networks, uh, safe houses that may not have been officially owned. You know, uh, uh, one of the things that's interesting was that the war continued for a little while by these uh, small groups of illegalists, one of the most famous being El Sabat, um, who was this guy who was pretty much just blowing the heads off of landlords and priests in the middle of Francoist Spain. And they, this guy, just his mere name inspired so much fear in the police and landlords and everything like that, you could chase him out. A whole class of criminals existed just to pretend to be this guy. And so in a lot of these revolutionary moments where maybe they collapsed or they didn't work out as a plan, it was these informal networks of comrades that were connected by this sort of radical friendship that said, look, if you're in trouble, I got you. I may not own this house, but I know a guy and you can stay there this time. It's much like what I find so interesting is, especially in the United States, the Underground Railroad. Right. This was an informal organization that had no hierarchical head. Yep. And yet, and yet, it was able to smuggle people, human beings, feed them, clothe them, bring them, travel them from the deep south all the way up to Canada. They did this without an internet connection. They did this without cell phones. 
Very, very mm -hmm. primitive technology. Now, I don't know about you, Brett, but I don't know anybody that could successfully smuggle my ass to Canada right now. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anybody that could do that. But these people were able to pull that off. And so I think absolutely I, I agree that we should, you know, establish strong uh, communities, you know, seize the land if you got it. And one of the things that, you know, I've because uh, I've, I've talked about this before, a lot of people, oh, well, we're working class. We can't, you know, necessarily buy property. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that I point people to is uh, the Bloods and the Crips don't necessarily own a lot of property. And yet at the same time, they seem to control it. So you may not necessarily own outright the land you're under. But if you can it, control enough power, just like in Boyle Heights, it, they're not stopping gentrification by buying the buildings right? They are physically telling these people, you are not going to do it. Otherwise, it will be bad for you. Right. Uh, I, I think that I, I'm interested to see where the revolutionary movement goes in the United States. I think there's going to be a certain group of people that may have a more nomadic structure. There's a certain group of people that may have a more community function. And I think most interesting is, and, and <clears throat> as um, has been brought up in this call, you know, it's uh, it's so easy for these people to get isolated because they are new people in the communities they go into. Um, I, I think what would be great would be a healthy interplay of the forces. You'd have a group of people that may travel in the South. In the South, there's a tradition of what they used to call circuit riders. And they were these preachers that like had no home and they just kind of ran these circuits and they pretty much depended upon, uh, the hospitality of the towns they were in. And so they would have these sort of lines, like it would take a whole year, but you'd visit like what, like 36, 48 different towns, preaching, whatever, whatever. Okay, what if we had a network of intentional communities and intentional communities 100%, yes, that is what we need. We need to go into these communities with the idea that we are founding revolutionary structures. And what if you had a skill? Let's say 3D printing. We would love for you to tour these communities. Don't just keep your skills in one community. Show everybody. Show us how to set. If you know how to set up solar panels, if you know how to do, you know, if, if you're really good at organic gardening, you should seek to teach other radicals and other revolutionaries and especially any other burgeoning communities those skills. Yeah. And so I think a healthy interplay of nomadic and sedentary forces would be beautiful. And again, th at that point, you are creating a full-blown culture. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for your call. Um, Bones, what do you think? One more call and then we're done? Uh, yeah, one more. Probably probably a quick one if we could just have one question. Uh, I've been pretty much keeping myself going on no food, yeah, beer, no, no, and no. rum. <laughs> That's what I'm worried about. But thank you. <laughs> Everybody that calls, we really appreciate it. Sometimes yes, we, have we, to, do. we have to cut it off just because it's the it's the function of how we do this. So people could call up, kind of condense their comment or their question, and then just maybe you just let us talk, and then we'll take the next call. It'll be really helpful. Um, but, yeah, we'll take one more one more really quick, and then we'll let Bones go because I know he's pressed against the wall on this one. You haven't eaten all day, have you? Um, I, I think I had, like, an English muffin with <laughs> nothing on it. Jesus. Yeah, and I worked 5 a.m. to 4. Jesus. Well, yeah. for anybody that wants to feed bones, we have a Patreon, Patreon backslash the guillotine. Uh, we just Please keep up, me alive. We just put it up today. It'll really help this show go forward in the future. We're still working out some kinks, but one more call. I could be. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, it's Lorena from Brazil. Wow, from Brazil. What's up? Oh, shit. How are you doing? Lorena has been a Rev Left fan from day fucking one. A great comrade and somebody that we've yes, actually formed a friendship yes. over. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, my internet connection is not the best, and also I'm not very sober right now. <laughs> Neither are we. So Don't I worry, we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question or anything um, to say? Yeah, I have a question for y'all. Uh, my question is in two hmm. parts. The first one is, like, you were all talking about um, building these communities from the ground. And at the same time, uh, the, the struggle, the organization that I'm in here in Brazil, uh, we work very differently than what the 
what's happening there in the U.S. I'm quite sure these things all also happen here in Brazil. I'm just probably not aware of it. Uh, but the thing is, I if you guys said something about like not preaching Marxism or bakuning to to people and you know building it from the ground, and I totally agree with that. But my problem is when you establish like a militia-like state, like the state of exception, and you, you become something like you see in the favelas here in Brazil, you know? Because you have um, entire communities uh, with that, who controls it is the drug dealers. And the police is not welcome there. They not they do not go there. But of course they have a deal with them. Uh, but they have no revolutionary theory, so um, they are just uh, drug, drug dealers. Uh, it could be like a, a huge project of community because they have um, the trust, and everyone there is is like a very strong community against police, against um, even abuse that happens inside. But still, they are just, they, they are a structure of drug dealers when they could have been um, very revolutionary if they had um, persisted in their revolutionary theory. Right. But I, I think I rambled a little. Oh, no, yeah, no. It's, I, I, yeah. I think that's 100% a uh, uh, valid critique. And I think especially what I find interesting is mm -hmm. the favelas in Brazil, okay, were uh, brought up specifically in a uh, Pentagon video uh, regarding their theories of the future. And basically the Pentagon said, look, by the year 2050, most modern cities will be totally ungovernable. Um, they used Brazil specifically as a model to where you had these large sort of nests of wealth and then people living um, in favelas and to where the gangs on the street were the law. And what's interesting is that the Pentagon, okay, now this is the, the most highly funded military in the world, on the planet, in human history, and they're saying we can't control it. There is no way that we can control the yeah, cities of the future. And so basically they're creating all these sort of tactics and theories like how we're going to use special operations. So I think, unfortunately, some of the... the, 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 the from, from the drug dealers in Brazil, like really, they, their practice is something to be learned from. Exactly. Uh, ding, 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 ding. Yes, yes. And that's exactly what I'm saying. We are revolutionaries. Okay. And I think especially as uh, Bon, our first caller said, you know, we have got to make sure that we're creating uh, communities where there isn't sexism, where there isn't racism, where we are, we aren't just a militia claiming territory and, you know, laying back and saying, oh boy, I get to walk around with an M16. Isn't this fun, guys? No, we're in this for something. And you are absolutely right that here are literal examples where, yeah, the government can't control these areas. It just can't. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, in my mind, especially when we have the Pentagon saying, look, 2050 cities across mm -hmm. the, the planet, uncontrollable. We're going to have to rely on special forces and strike teams because we just can't control these areas. Look, folks, my question is, who do you want to control it? Because there's a power vacuum coming. OK, now it can either be us revolutionaries interested in egalitarianism, freedom, expression, creativity, or you could have the white nationalist militias who are buying land, guns, doing all these different things. Or you could just literally, whoever happens to be the strongest force and whatever the hell they want. So I, I, I think yeah. you're absolutely right. It's something we have to, uh, what's the word Bookchin used? Like a par paraloquialism? Very, I don't know, yeah. and, and xenophobia is a great word for it. Where it's like, okay, our neighborhood above everybody else, fuck everybody else. We want to get away from that. But you're, you're absolutely right, caller. That uh, we have so much to learn from, at least on a total praxis level. Okay, how do these people work on a day to day basis? Radicals need to be looking towards that sort of organizing and, and pulling lessons while maintaining our sort of 
revolutionary coherency. Any last words, Lorena? Yeah, uh, I just want to say hi to Yasmin. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the work, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. You too. <laughs> we love you. Thank you. <laughs> have a great night. Yeah, I'll, I'll say. Um, I'll say that Lorena was one of the first fans of Rev Left Radio, and um, after the Charlottesville attack, Lorena messaged me um, through the Rev Left Radio page and, and and showed concern about my children. And I've mentioned it a lot. Um, since then, it was the first listener ever that was like, I hope your kids are okay. And for that, I'll always love Morena, um, somebody that cared enough to message me asking about my children. It brought me to tears when I read that. I'll just say quickly that, you know, capitalism creates the spaces for black markets to arise, the alienation that leads people to seek out drugs and the rise of cartels and, you know, money laundering and, and crime syndicates is very much a manifestation of capitalism. It's very hard to deal with those situations when they own and operate communities. They're very entrenched. They're, they're in some sense, maybe better than the state or worse than the state, depending on where you're at. But we need to get armed, we need to get organized, and we need to carve out our own spaces. And if that means kicking out the cops, or if that means kicking out the gangs, or if that means kicking out the mafia, whatever it may be, that's one or thing. Or forming our own. Yeah, or forming our own. And, and, and an option. And in a lot of cases, the gangs, um, you know, in, in poor parts of cities are just a reaction to a capitalist fucking dystopia. And selling drugs is the only economic activity that exists in those societies. So, Although I, I do yeah. want to say, when the revolution comes, I, I still want drugs. Oh, please. Let God. me be very yeah. clear. I still want <laughs> Mushrooms drugs. Mushrooms and acid and marijuana, preferably, are. are goddamn <laughs> right. I'm seeking out those drugs, goddammit. <laughs> So yeah, maybe in some cases we can we can form alliances with these street gangs because they're the proletariat. You know, Marx called them the lumpen proletariat, people that are forced to to adhere to criminal activity in order to get by. And if we wipe out those those conditions that give rise to that criminal behavior um, and give rise to the chaos and and you know violence that's are inherent in cartels and street gangs, we can form alliances with with those people because they are of those communities in a lot of cases. Oh well, yeah, and, and it's complicated. Like I said, I I, th I think we're coming towards a power vacuum, and folks, look, it's coming. As we discussed tonight, the world is changing. It's changing right in front of your eyes. It's happening faster and faster and faster, and your future is slowly disappearing. Now, what are you going to invest in? Do you want to pour your money in a four hundred one k in a shaky stock market, or do you want to invest? in a group of comrades, in a community? And do you want to, in the process of fighting the same system that is actively destroying you, discover a life and discover a life that makes you feel like life is worth living? That's the goal, folks. That's and I think goal. we have had a fantastic episode. Now, if you don't excuse me, Brett, I'm about to literally piss in a beer can. <laughs> if I don't step away from this mic. I've been holding on because I do not want two podcasts where I literally piss on air in a beer can. <laughs> All right, brother. Bad form. Go piss, man. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for calling. Good night, everybody. It's been great. Solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.
Yeah.